Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Madison Spenrath, MDI Coordinator at the Human Early Learning Partnership at UBC. I'm going to start with a couple of housekeeping items and then introduce our speakers. So here's what you are seeing on your end. If you would prefer to use your telephone instead of mic and speakers on your device, click on the telephone for the dial-in number and long distance charges may apply. All participants are now muted, but later on we will take questions and you can raise your hand to signal that you would like to be unmuted to ask a question. And you can also type in a question at any time throughout the webinar. If you are having any technical issues, please contact GoToWebinar support at this 877-582-7011 phone number. So now to introduce our speakers. I'd like to welcome Dr. Kim Shonet Reichel and Greg Smith joining us from Vancouver Island. Kim is a professor in the Department of Education and Counseling Psychology and Special Education at and the Director of Health. She began her career teaching children and adolescents identified as at risk, and her research program focuses on social and emotional learning and development of children and adolescents. Kim will explore newly released MDI data highlights. Smith is superintendent of Alberta School District in BC and a longtime collaborator on the Middle Years Development Instrument Study. Greg will share how Alberni School District has worked with MDI in setting goals and weaving well-being into school planning. So Kim will be presenting for the first 30 minutes, followed by Greg for 10 minutes, and then we will open it up for questions. Many participants submitted some questions ahead of time, so thank you for that. And please submit any additional questions throughout the presentation, which we will field to Kim and Greg. So thanks again. I will now hand over to Kim. Great. Thank you, Maddie. Um, and welcome, everyone. It's very exciting to be here with all of you and to be able to um, hear about, um, to be able to talk about the Middle Years Development Instrument and some of the findings. And um, it will be important as we go through to think of what your questions might be for us as we as I move through some of the slides. And I, and I also want to say it's a, it's a treat today to have Greg Smith in here. Superintendent um, of Port Alberni to be able to share some of the ways in which he has used MDI data to move to action. So we're very excited about this. So as you see, I have an overview here that is going through. I'm going to just give you a little bit about who the Human Early Learning Partnership is at UBC, um, why now and what now do we need to be thinking about children's well-being in the middle years. Um, I'm going to give you some background on the middle years development instrument and a description. I know many of you are very familiar with it, um, some, but you know, looking at the list of participants, we see there's a wide range of people who, who are both uh, have used the MDI for a number of years and some who are just brand new and thinking about the MDI. So that's why we'll spend some time going through that. And we'll talk about the middle years development instrument, some reports and some examples findings and some new data analysis. So this is not going to be a detailed examination of findings across the province, but just some snippets and some uh, taste of what we're learning. And then from data to action, we'll talk a bit about our newly developed field guide and then have Greg share with us some wonderful, amazing things that he's been doing in his district. So for you, those of you who are un unfamiliar, uh, the Human Early Learning Partnership, also known as HELP, is an interdisciplinary research institute at UBC. Our vision is really all children thriving in healthy societies. We also use a Brenner model, a bioecological model of development that really looks at the multiple levels of influence on children's development from, from the close influences of family, school, culture, and peers out to the community. And then of course, looking at policy and other types of social conditions. In this, we really recognize that children, uh, we need to examine children in context and the multiple spheres of influence. Asking questions are, what are the differences that make a difference? And a focus on both risk and resiliency, those differences um, that make a difference in um, buttressing risk and uh, helping children thrive and flourish. Our strategic priorities that help are um, a human development program of research along with child development and monitoring systems and 
and throughout all of that is this knowledge translation, which is really today is an example of one of the ways in which help helps translate the knowledge as we take the data that we've gathered and we now talk about it in a way that can make sense to schools and communities to move to action. Um, we also work uh, closely with um, communities, provincial, national and international partners and really have an, a healthy organization model that runs throughout that. Um, just a sort of glimpse at a HELP's monitoring system. Some of you might have heard of the EDI, the Early Development Instrument. We link this to the MDI in grade four and grade seven. We have a newly developed measure called the CHECK or the Childhood Experiences Questionnaire that will be now is being piloted across 12 districts um, and looks at children's experiences before they enter school. And uh, in development are the TDI or the Toddler Development Instrument and the YDI or the Youth Development Instrument. Um, but I'm not going to go into any detail about those. So, and just to give a bit of context of why we need to, you know, look at the well-being of children, you know, this is it's kind of a new thing, at least in the education sectors, is, you know, often we looked at the indis index of um, how children were doing was their solely their academic achievement. But we're now moving beyond that to look at other aspects of children's uh, development. Given recent increases in problems or changes and challenges or risk factors that occur across childhood, we know, for instance, that um, many children encounter uh, stress, but we call it toxic stress when it really goes beyond what's a typical stressful um, idea. And we're actually seeing increasing, as I'll show you later, increasing levels of children reporting anxiety or worries. Um, toxic stress, uh, and when children experience it, it can have very negative effects on learning, on development, and in fact, uh, research is now re showing us that higher levels of cortisol, which is a stress hormone, actually interfere with brain development, especially in one part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for decision-making, impulse control, working memory, and children, especially those children, in poverty who have higher levels of stress both at home and in the community um, can have uh, impairment to this prefrontal cortex and often children with toxic stress can look like they have attention de deficit disorder when in fact they have this uh, high levels of stress that um, really undermine their capacity to succeed. Um, we also know that um, this is can be mitigated by positive adult relationships and adults, uh, supportive adult relationships at home, at school, and the community can, can help buffer these negative the effects of toxic stress. We also know from recent research that there's a stress contagion, um, that, that this idea that like the common cold, that stress can be contagious. And in fact, that um, children, uh, one study that we did, Ava Oberly, a colleague of mine at HELP, and I did um, last year, that was published last year, was we looked at stress contagion in the classroom, and we found that teachers grades four to seven who had the highest levels of stress and burnout had children who, in their classrooms, who had higher levels of the hormone cortisol that was collected through saliva. So this idea that higher levels of teacher stress and burnout was associated with students' levels of stress as uh, indicated by cortisol really shows that this notion of that what can happen in an environment. Now, these data are correlational. And in fact, you can't say what caught, you know, were the teachers coming in with higher levels of stress and burnout, were the students coming in with higher levels of stress from home um, or some combination, but we do know it's it's reaching uh, important, um, uh, a number of children it's affecting. And you think, uh, you know, what does this mean for uh, teaching and learning in the school, um, in the school and as well as outside of school? And we also know some other decreases in child well-being. And here's an example of empathy where we find that children today are less empathic and more self-absorbed. One recent study found decreases in empathy in 14,000 college students between 1979 and 2009, and especially since 2000. But this idea of how children's well-being is being compromised, and, and many of you might go right away to technology and think about, you know, what is the influence of technology on children and how they communicate? You know, how many of our are, are communicating through social media rather than face-to-face, -face, which is an important aspect. Face-to-face uh, -face conversations are an important aspect of empathy development. So what now, where do we go? And this is really where the middle years development um, instrument uh, fits in, this idea of what can we do, how can we first know how our children are doing and where can we go 
and what has the science told us. We know there's uh, decades of research on resiliency and the recent science really telling us, uh, helping us identify what are the differences that make a difference. How do we help children overcome the odds against them or overcome adversity? And that's really what informs the research research. There's really a focus um, of moving away, a paradigm shift, as we so to speak, is this idea from moving from away from Ill, a focus solely on ill-being to a focus on prevention uh, and well-being. So instead of waiting till children have fallen into the water and throwing them the life preserver uh, once, you know, to help them back up, we are now working toward prevention and this metaphor of the life jacket where that will equip them with the tools so that if they fall into the water, they'll stay afloat. Um, we also have moved this notion, uh, although it has been around for education for thousands of years, um, this idea um, Aristotle actually said to educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all, but we now know that there's an inextricable link between children's um, emotional development and their cognitive development. And so people are bringing this notion of educating the heart into schools. Um, for example, Dan Goleman, many of you will be familiar with his work from 1995, his best-selling book on emotional intelligence. He really talked about how analytical intelligence or IQ accounts for only 10% to 15% of job success and other real world outcomes and well-being. And there's a number of different studies now emerging that shows that these soft skills, as they're often called, or non-cognitive skills, although I don't like either of those terms, um, that are actually showing that they're actually um, better predictors of school success and life, su uh, life success than is academic achievement. Um, again, changing the way we think about what it means to do well in life. There's been a growing mo movement toward um, a field called social and emotional learning. Um, really talking about that you can integrate um, different aspects of social and emotional development and that children will learn um, uh, better when they have social and emotional learning approaches. CASEL, or the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, has identified five dimensions of uh, social emotional competence that include self-awareness, you know, being aware of your strengths and weaknesses, self-management or self-regulation, how you manage your emotions, impulse control, social awareness, including empathy, um, being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes, you know, that perspective taking, relationship skills, how you get along with others, how you manage conflicts, and responsible decision making, thinking about how your own behaviors will affect others. And these now are integrated into schools um, and communities and after school programming across the country and and internationally. Um, I was just going to mention one of the studies that some of you have probably heard about is a meta-analysis that was done a few years ago looking at uh, differences between children who were engaged in programs that promoted their social and emotional learning in school and contrasted them to children who were not in such programs. And they included over 200 studies and looked at over 270,000 children. And they found that um, when you when you, children were exposed to these social and emotional learning programs, it not only increased their uh, self-awareness, their social awareness, it made them have better social emotional competencies and less aggressive behavior. It also found, the study also found that um, programs, classrooms in which there was a focus on social emotional learning also led to students' uh, increases in academic achievement. And in fact, children who were exposed to social and emotional learning programs had an 11% point higher in academic achievement than children not exposed. So there's lots of data there, um, and I certainly can go on about that further. People have questions or give you a lot of resources. Only to say that when you think about social and emotional learning, this is really about uh, as well as about the middle years development instrument, we need to look at multiple contexts. We need to always take into account three different dimensions, the learning context, direct uh, school climate, a sense of belonging, a sense of connectedness to the adults in the school, um, the social emotional learning of the educators, their own well-being, as I mentioned, the stress contagion, um, and then the social emotional learning of the students, some sort of direct instruction, both inside and outside the school. It's so one of the most, um, important findings in recent years is this idea that these skills are malleable. The social emotional skills are, in fact, um, can be taught um, and that uh, due to recent um, sort of advances in neuro and neuroplasticity, we can promote that. Um, now, a bit of an introduction to the 
the MDI. Um, so what is most beneficial about the MDI? We have reports and data. It's an opportunity for inquiry, learning, and classroom discussion and discussion in the um, community. It's uh, principals, teachers, and community members use the reports um, through as a conversation starter with educators, parents, community, and children. It's a source of information about students' lives and what's happening outside of school as well, and can be used in school planning and program planning with the school reports. What's new this year for those of you who've uh, been using the MDI from previous years, implementing it in your districts, that this is the first year that we have reported um, the MDI school reports much earlier than they have been. We often didn't report it till um, May, and now this year we had early February, and the same is again for next year. We've aligned, uh, second, we've aligned the MDI with the personal and social competencies in the BC News, new, uh, BC new redesign of the curriculum, um, it, uh, competencies, and we have the MDI field guide. Um, and I'll talk just briefly about that, but it's a whole resource, treasure trove of resources to move to action. As I've mentioned before, one of the things is that EDI and MDI could be linked. And certainly um, we have some data showing that these, uh, for example, the data show that children's social emotional competence in kindergarten is a good predictor of how children are doing grade four and grade seven. And we're in the process of doing some more analyses around there. Um, some uh, questions that the MDI answers, uh, how can we help children feel more supported, experience success? Uh, what can we do to lead children on a positive path to becoming caring and contributing citizens of tomorrow? And what can children tell us with their voice what they need in order to feel competent and cared for? And these are some of the questions that are addressed in the MDI. So briefly, uh, MDI, it's a self-report survey for children in grades four and seven. It's, it's um, data that are collected online. Children uh, sit in the computer and answer the questions. It's strengths-based. It's linked to health, well-being, and success, and social emotional development, both inside and outside of school. Um, the MDI was developed based on recent scientific research. We really uh, drew from the latest science on what we know about how uh, children's social emotional learning development. We drew from positive psychology um, that identified things like optimism and happiness are important for development, and also um, looking at resilience. What are the assets? What do we know out in the school and the community um, that help children flourish and thrive? And it was developed through a collaborative process. We brought in, um, over a few year process, really brought in scientific experts, teachers, children, and community members that helped co-design co the MDI and the questions. It's used at a population level and not used as an individual diagnostic tool. It's not considered um, as a clinical assessment tool. Again, it's a universal, it's used to, to get a snapshot of how children at the population are doing in their well-being. Why is it important? Um, we know that middle childhood has often been a neglected area of development. Uh, up until recently, we know that um, we knew very little about children in middle childhood except from uh, foundational skills assessment. And now we have a much broader vi vi vision of an understanding of middle childhood. We know that these grades fourth and seventh are really transitional time in development, cognitively, socially, academically, and physically. Um, and hence that makes it a time of increased vulnerability, but a time of increased um, a window of opportunity in which to put in interventions, hence the reason why we focus on this pre-adolescent period. And in fact, um, other researchers in the area of neuroscience identify um, this age period as, as high malleability in terms of neuroplasticity. So lots of um, interventions can have far reach during this development period. We focus on development of the whole child, the physical, the social, the emotional, even the spiritual aspects of children to think about how they're doing. We look at multiple contexts, including children in schools and families and in neighborhoods. And there's the inclusion of a focus on children's voices. What can they tell us? Um, we ask them, we go directly to them, to the uh, ones who can give us the most, the most accurate information on their well-being um, instead of asking others. Um, and just align with the UN Conventions of the Rights of the Child, Article 12, where children have a right to be give their opinion and be listened to about the adults around them. You know, just as a note, you know, early on when we went to the children and told them about the MDI and asked for their input, uh, we told them that they were our teachers, that they were going to help us learn how to create a better world for them. So it's essential that we get these data back to the children as well. 
and uh, really emphasized throughout the MDI, you'll learn um, when we talk about when I talk about some of the results is relationships are seen as key. Um, in fact, Sonia Luther, who did research on resilience or did a summary of five decades of research on, um, on resiliency, found that the single most important factor that promotes the resilience of children are relationships, our relationships with adults in the home, at school, and in the community. Um, I know uh, Jack Shonkoff and colleagues at the Center for the Developing Child have said that every child who ends up doing well has had at least one stable and committed relationship with a supportive adult. And uh, my favorite quote that I use in every <laughs> presentation by Yuri Braun from Brunner, yes, the same the bioecological model, is every child requires someone in his or her life who's absolutely crazy about them. So what is the MDI measure? It has five dimensions, so, emotional development, including things like optimism and empathy, physical health and well-being, connectedness to adults at home and in the school and the community, as well as friendships, school experiences, as well as the use of after school time. The dimensions, as I, as I mentioned here, some uh, gives you some of the measures. As you see, the social emotional development has a number of different uh, dimensions, including empathy, absence of worries, which is anxiety, self-regulation, a number of other ones were added for the grade seven. We look at uh, physical health and well-being besides nutrition, but also eating meals with adults at home, which we know is so important for resiliency. Good sleep, again, another important aspect. Connectedness to adults at school, the neighborhood at home, here, belonging, friendship, intimacy, intimacy, and important adults, use of after school time, including lessons, structured activities, um, free time activities, as well as their wishes and barriers, and then school experiences that looks at a number of things like academic self con uh, concepts, school climate, school belonging, um, future goals, as well as victimization and bullying, how much they are exposed to things like cyber bullying, um, physical, verbal or social. <clears throat> we have an index of well-being that takes into account these different dimensions. So you just get a snapshot that includes these different dimensions. And then we also have um, assets indexes that look at um, the connectedness uh, to others, as well as nutrition and sleep and after school uh, activities as well. Uh, this is, gives you a sense of our well-being index, as I mentioned, and we categorize children into low well-being, medium well-being, and high well-being, or thriving. And this is what I said, it's a strength-based measure. And our assets index look at adult relationships, peer relationships, nutrition and sleep, and after-school activities. What's so important about these assets is they're actionable. That means you could do something about these. And that's really why we devised the MDI to not have just the index of well being, but also those factors that can make a difference in children's lives. It's aligned with the BC uh, new curriculum, as I mentioned before, where we, uh, that includes things like positive personal and cultural identity, personal awareness and responsibility, and social responsibility. The MDI has measured on this. There's, this just gives you a snap, snapshot of some of the ways it's specifically uh, measured, and this would be found in all of your school uh, district and community reports as well, this uh, infographic. The, uh, the MDI also uh, measures all five dimensions of CASEL's uh, social and emotional learning skills, and as you see here, there's an alignment between things like um, responsible decision-making, or self-regulation, just to give you a snapshot for those of you who might not be in province and know the BC curriculum, um, you might be interested in how it's linked to social and emotional learning. So uh, since, uh, just to give you a, an idea, since um, 2010, we've collected data on 56,797 children, fourth and seventh grade, 31 districts we have coverage. And um, this year, this past year, 2016, 2017, we have data on um, almost uh, 14,000 students. We have a nation, national scale out project, and I believe there might be some people online who are or listening um, or going to listen to the webinar who are from them, these um, I, uh, other places, but you would see that it's spreading throughout Canada and the world. We have a number of countries that are interested in um, using the MDI across a variety of research projects and community initiatives. Uh, you'll, uh, as you see here, there's a number of reports you can get, and uh, those are all available online. 
So let me just give you now, just uh, walk you through a couple of the key findings. As I mentioned in the beginning, I'm not going to be going into any detail, but I thought I'd just present some of the key findings that stuck out for me um, and are ones that are particularly resonant when I go and do presentations uh, to different communities. So the key finding, uh, key findings number one, um, first of all, there are differences in well-being between grades four and grade seven. Um, I'll have you guess which who do you think scores higher in the percentage of children thriving, children who are in grade four or grade seven, if you think about that. Um, and the percent of children thriving has declined in the last few years when we look at trends over time across the um, different uh, data collection points on the MDI. So here you'll see grade four to grade seven. And if you were trying to guess uh, and guess that grade fours would have higher percentage of children thriving, you were correct. Uh, we found this year that 45% of grade fours were in the thriving range and uh, in contrast to grade sevens where there was 40% were in that thriving. And so you can see um, there again are a greater proportion of students in grade seven who are in the low category. Um, so I'm looking at uh, trends over time. We see uh, here, I'll just bring you through grade four, and this is from 2012 to 2012-13 uh, to this present year, where you'll see uh, sort of a decline from around 50% uh, in 2012-2013 of the children in the thriving category to 45% of children in the category. Um, as well as you'll see that, um, again, there's a decline in grade seven while in well while being indexed from a higher, uh, you know, about 45% to 40%. And again, it'd be interesting, is this reflective of the different districts participating? Is it reflective of some lar lar other larger societal things happening in BC with children? And, um, and, you know, could it be, you know, just thinking um, about other events that are happening across BC? In terms of that, be interesting to have that conversation. Um, a key finding too is that we found that there's social and emotional competence. Um, children shows shows variability across school districts. So I went through many school district reports just to find out what are some ways that we could see. Um, so for example, here's one school district of grade four, and you see that 83% um, of children have uh, are in the thriving for empathy. And uh, pro-social behavior is 58%, uh, much higher. So they were above the district average in the pro-social behavior um, and right on par with the optimism. Um, here's a grade seven where, in fact, you see that um, they that for empathy, for example, they were below um, the, the provincial average of almost 76%. Optimism was lower. Um, a larger proportion of children had low optimism in the red category, just to sort of bring you through, as well as the pro-social behavior. Um, grade seven, here's another uh, school district. Again, you see the variability where in this time, uh, empathy was much lower at 68% compared to the district average, as well as pro-social behavior. So we see this variability across school districts um, to see you know, um, where are they high and where are they low? I always like to take a strengths-based approach, you know, when presenting your data. But again, it's something to think about and how you, it, districts compare and then finding out what are those districts doing that are doing really well? Is there something, some way to learn from each other? Here's um, in terms of looking at, I, I brought this up just really if you want to focus on the happiness and the um, worries. Here's a district grade four where 43% of the grade four children are um, high in the uh, worries. Uh, so it's it's reverse scored. So green is good, uh, red is not so good. And uh, here you see a great proportion of children in grade four in this district who have worries. Um, here's another district where there's a much smaller proportion, well, 30% is still uh, much higher. And another district where a grade seven, it's 26%. So you see this variability across the districts. Um, the last finding um, is the, uh, well, not the last, it's key finding number three, is connectedness to adults and schools change among grade fours and grade sevens. And there's availability among schools for connectedness to adults. So I'll first ask you, who do you think is going to have report greater connectedness to adults if they're asked the question, how many adults at the school are important to you? There are two or more, there's one or there's zero. So I'll have you think who's higher, fours or sevens, and if you're thinking, Here's the provincial numbers that grade fours, uh, here grade four, 73% of grade fours, this is a cause to celebrate, 
uh, across the province say that they have two or more adults at their school who are important to them. Um, now, you might look at glass half full and say 18% have none or no one, um, you know, because you'd think that that would be um, lower, you'd hope. Um, but what we find is there's here's one school district. Um, there's tremendous variability even within a school district. I went and I categorized all the ones across the schools. So some grade four classrooms had as low as 57% of children who said two or more to 89% said two or more. And then the other one was where they had um, some school dis some some schools in one school district said only five percent had no one all the way up to 34 percent saying there was no one at that school here's the provincial numbers for uh grade sevens and if you thought that grade fours would be higher number of two or more you were correct because by grade seven 45 percent say there's two or more adults who are important to me and a whopping 43 percent across the province say there's no one at this school who's important to me and again, the variability is great where there are some school districts that in grade seven say two or more, there's 52% um, of grade sevens all the way to almost uh, at some districts, uh, some schools that say almost, well, they say virtually half of the kids say no one at the school is important to me. Um, this is just a, an example from Port Alberni. Greg, I hope you don't mind. I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here, but I just love these data. Um, they looked at their data in 2013, 2014 of grade sevens and said 53% say there's no one. Well, let's do something about it. And uh, actually, Greg, it'd be great for you to you might mention this, but uh, and this moved again by a sort of concerted effort of 38% um, down and all the way in 2015, 2016 of 30%. And finally, connectedness matters. And I wanted to show you some data that we've just analyzed, and this is sort of a hot off the press, that there's a relationship between social and emotional needs and number of important adults at school. So let's look at what that relationship is. Here we look at grade fours across the province, optimism, happiness, and self-concept. And what you see, and really what I want you to look at here, is the staircase. Consistently, those children who say they have two or more adults, they score higher in almost every dimension of well-being. They're more optimistic, they're happier, they have higher self-concept than those children who even say they have one adult. And, if, and you might imagine those children who say no one are lowest on every dimension. But the staircase, again, is kind of provocative in the saying, why is it two or more adults? I thought it was Kim, you said it was just one adult. What about the two or more? So that's a great conversation to have. And as you see, the same pattern remains for grade seven as well. Um, what's important, um, in just showing these data, what's important to keep in mind um, what we find is that typically you will see a grade four uh, decline in well-being from grade four to grade seven. What we find in the data are is that those students who go to grade seven but remain connected to an adult, they do not have to decline, as you can see here in terms of the optimism, happiness, self-concept. Here are some other dimensions. Again, you see grade fours, especially under pro-social, you can see quite um, you know, a large, those kids who have two um, versus no one as well. And this was looking at self-regulation short-term and self-regulation long-term as well. Um, and then uh, again, grade sevens, a very similar pattern really marked in terms of the pro-social. Those uh, grade sevens, you know, it's kind of interesting who has, a, who has an important adult at school remain connected and are able to behave in a, a pro-social manner. Um, also with the terms of the self-regulation, again, these are um, showing significant trends. And then when we look at uh, schools and things like academic self-concept, school climate, school belonging, you again see this very interesting trend of those students who have two or more adults having the highest, those with one in the middle and those with um, no, no adults is uh, low. And I'll show you just the same pattern. So you just keep on seeing this pattern of uh, uh, relationships, a staircase that really shows, um, again, what this points to is where to put your efforts is about making the connections to adults. So um, just to wrap up here so we can get Greg on, um, I'm so curious, I just, I can't wait to hear what Greg has to say, is a moving to action. And this is really such a central part, you know, uh, the data are one thing, but data are the first step. You have to move to action. Uh, data are important because the data are on local, local schools, um, you get to see your MDI results. So what do you do? Well, as I said, there's this wonderful new uh, MDI field guide 
uh, www.discovermdi.ca. And here you'll find all sorts of resources on how to use your data, how to understand the concepts, how to conduct focus groups, as well as other links to lots of important things. And this is in its early stages, so it will be um, filled with many other resources. But again, this is, uh, we've really worked close with community to find people want um, both uh, through educators and community members as well and even bringing in children to the um, picture we have a video that's up there that would be a great uh, very short video that is a begin a uh, great conversation starter to start thinking about how you present mdi to others and uh, i think some of you probably got the link to it um, before this um, one thing also just think of the mdi data are not just for school even though they're collected in schools they are for many other people from organizations to policy makers to health agencies and also um, as you move forward and this will be great to see how uh, when greg talks about you know first step is it mdi data are a way to engage in conversations and be curious instead of saying you know like this caused this you know to say well this is curious and why are our kids so high in empathy or why are they have so many worries how do we move forward for that um think big you know we want to change the uh, of all our students, but start small. We're going to start with one one project, making something a significant change, and then involve students. Um, not nothing. It, well, really involve all stakeholders, but children are the ones um, who have taken the time to complete it. So to be able to engage them as well, and then learn from the success of others. And I'm I'm ending here as I'm going to move on to Greg, and uh, because this is really where we're going with the learn from the success of others. Thank you. Um, I'm going to unmute Greg and hand it over to you. Thanks, Maddie. Uh, um, thanks, Kim, and a warm welcome from the beautiful wild west coast of BC. Um, if I can have that first slide, Maddie. Thanks. So I'm really proud to speak on behalf of our district as it's really their story more so than mine. And my goal today is to briefly outline our approach to well-being, our well-being journey in our district, and the role the MDI plays in our district. So just a little bit about SD70, uh, some quick facts here on the next slide. Is that, um, you know, really what we're trying to highlight here is that we're a rural and urban district. We are large and small in our school sizes. We have a diverse population and we have a long history working with help. So, um, you know, we're, we're not a massive district, but um, we do feel that we, we capture a lot of what goes on in schools. Uh, that's quite typical in other districts across BC. So next slide. Our journey. Uh, as a district, I would say that we are all over this map. Some schools and teachers are racing ahead. Some are thoughtfully exploring, some cautiously following, and, and some still overcoming inertia. We used to attribute poor student academic performance to a variety of social, economic, cultural, and educational factors outside our control. We'd sometimes rationalize things by pointing out where our community scored on various social indicators, and it was all true. But I believe over time, we gradually came to realize that if all these factors are so impactful in student academic success, then maybe we ought to do something about it, and, and we have. Today, I think we have a core understanding among our educators that student well-being makes a difference, and hopefully we can simultaneously focus on well-being and intellectual development rather than an either-or approach. Next. So what we've seen here is a big shift in our, in our thinking. Over time, we've shifted our thinking to um, focus on students' potentials rather than their limitations to focus on well-being rather than ill-being, to challenge our assumptions about the role of schools and teachers. And you know, we've heard all these, these comments before. And people, teachers would say, it's not my job. And we would say, yes, it is. Human and social development is the goal of the education system shared by schools, families, and communities, and it's everybody's responsibility. Teachers would say they didn't have time, and we suggest that they do. The redesigned curriculum provides more time and space and expectation through core competencies for attention to student well-being. They would suggest that it couldn't be taught and we would counter that it, that it can and that you can teach social and emotional competencies the skills such as empathy, optimism, and self-regulation. Uh, they would sometimes question whether they would be the individual and of course they were. Every adult can and should be an important person in a child's life, can create connectedness and model desirable behaviors. 
and and they would say but it's it's not just me it's it's uh, it's a community and we, and we would agree with them um, and we need to involve them we need to engage students parents community members but let's start with our classrooms and our schools and and teachers did it's not to say that during our journey we were we ignored student well-being as we shifted from a reluctance to acceptance even in the early years of our journey some teachers are doing things in their schools one of the defining moments for me was early in my first month as superintendent when a facilitator from the Dalai Lama Center for Peace and Education was sharing the heart mind online with a group of elementary teachers. I was in attendance and one of the teachers commented that they were pleased to see that I valued student well-being and that I was giving them permission to explore the, uh, the area of student well-being. Once I got over my shock that teachers felt they needed permission to attend to student well-being, I commented that it was more than permission. It was an expectation. It was an imperative for us to focus on well-being as much as intellectual development. So if we move on to the next slide. After this session, I heard from teachers about programs they were doing or approaches in their schools or from students or parents about what their teacher or school was doing. Many of them were really good. And the lottery ball show the many, many programs or approaches at one time or another present in our schools. But it was far from consistent, coherent, or universal. In fact, other than a district attention to self-regulation and the MDI, it was quite hit and miss, often dependent on an individual teacher or school administrator. It was random. The key piece or takeaway here is that well-being should not be left to a lottery. It can't be random or dependent on the luck of the draw as to which school a student attends or which teacher a student has. It's a shared belief in a culture, not a haphazard collection of programs. So we moved this uh, and, and, and took that imperative and intention and connected it to the Enhancing Student Learning Framework, which was being revised in our, in our province. We simply translated the system mandate of intellectual, human and social and career development into six aspirational goal statements. And these goal statements are the basis of our school and district planning. The two here capture the shared re responsibility for human and social development and provide coherence and consistency to our well-being efforts. They help address the well-being lottery. So why the MDI? And, and it's, it's been such an important tool for us. The MDI, both as a tool and a framework, helps us make sense of well-being, finds connections between programs and approaches, and develops our capacity in the area. It broadly defines well-being uh, based on current research, it translates this knowledge into something understandable and usable, and it provides evidence to encourage us to dig deeper and inspire us to learn more. And it focuses on, on strengths and assets, as Kim said, rather than vulnerability or deficits. And, and most importantly, it's based on student voice, reliable student voice. It's, it's students telling us about their experiences and us learning from them. So together with the Heart Mind Wellbeing Framework from the DLC, it helps us conceptualize well-being in a BC context, including the new personal and social core competencies. And, and very importantly, UBC help is there to support, guide, and encourage us. So how have we used the MDI um, historically? Uh, for a time, honestly, we didn't do much with the MDI. We had the reports, we looked at the data, we asked thought-provoking questions, but we didn't make best use of the information or of help. And then we decided to become intentional about student well-being and the reports became very important. And, and I think Kim showed a slide of our results earlier, and that's when we really began to dive into this. So we brought in someone knowledgeable about both the MDI and our earlier work with the Heart Mind Wellbeing for a focused, purposeful exploration of the MDI structure, interpreting evidence, reflecting on data, and, and moving to action. While I thought we were pretty data literate before, working with self-reported data was a challenge, you know, challenge for some of us and it challenged some of our assumptions and old ways of looking at a different type of student evidence. The MDI data is now a key indicator in our school well-being plans, complementing other evidence from satisfaction surveys, McCurry Adolescent Health Surveys, and so on. Some of our system planning considerations as we looked at this, um, because the, the well-being task may appear overwhelming, we focused on our schools as a starting point. For example, and using that concentric circle on the left, evidence relating to sleep and nutrition is of great interest to educators. It has a significant influence on students we teach, yet it's not an area we explicitly control. So rather than identifying it as a school goal, we work at a district level with community partners and parents in considering the sleep and nutrition information. 
Instead, our school plan efforts focus on data that's unique to schools, such as that found in the school experiences, on universal assets like connectedness, teachable skills such as self-regulation, or assets we can encourage or provide like after-school activity, things over which we collectively agree we have greater control or influence. Similarly, the increased awareness among teachers and administrators has made this as much a bottom-up change as it is top-down. It's really more a matter of harnessing and shaping our efforts than generating interest or energy. We're getting to the inside-out, outside-in change, but, but this will occur over time and with more confidence in our internal um, efforts. So how do we use the, the school planning in the MDI? Schools and districts do so much that never shows up in a school plan. Because a school identifies connectedness as a well-being goal, doesn't mean that it stops teaching pro-social skills or empathy or compassion. Sometimes an area like a short or long term self-regulation is a district focus and, and the school simply looks at other evidence in the MDI and uses it to help shape its school plan. School planning simply means that a school has thoughtfully reviewed available evidence, it's considered what it's currently doing, and identified a growth area that is both suggested by the data and resonates with the school community. Because there is so much interconnectedness between the MDI dimensions, we're really confident that developing a skill or increasing an asset is bound to positively impact on and be reflected in other areas. What's especially nice, and as Kim mentioned, when we get the MDI data, it arrives in early spring, giving schools time to focus on their well-being goal before they're inundated with a bunch of summative academic achievement data in July. So it gives us administrators uh, an opportunity to work with staff and parents and other community members to be in reflecting on current year plans and planning for the next year. An actual school plan is, um, is presented here. It's not really intended uh, for you to read, but it's to illustrate the plans are simple, concise, and straightforward. We're, we're currently in the process of reformatting all our plans to look like this. They'll be um, finished by the end of the month and, and up on our website so people can take a look at them as they are public documents. It's a really simple structure. We take our system goal, the school breaks it down into a smaller component, uh, provides a rationale for why they selected it and some objectives for the upcoming year. As you can see, we, we incorporate the MDI results right into our school plans. We outline what we're going to do and, and we have a, uh, an express method for how we're going to tell our story with uh, the public. In addition to the school-based processes, all our school administrators share their plans with each other and present their school plans to trustees at a public board meeting. But we don't just use the, the data in our school plans, we also try to engage with our community. And while we've initially focused on working in school, we know that we live and grow in community and that what we're really doing is we're collectively engaged in village raising and community development. Our, our work in schools, though, helps our partners find areas to connect and engage the school system, something they desperately want and, and we try to welcome. Uh, district and community results have been shared with all of these partners, and, and Kim had mentioned some before, but these are our community groups, agencies, and others in our community we've shared our data with, and it's a great conversation starter about how we can improve outcomes for children and youth and ultimately enhance our community. And it's clear that the you know, Island Health Authority, MCFD, Child Youth Mental Health, Children First, they serve um, similar clients. So it's really important to them. But what's really neat to see is how the RCMP took the data and used it to help shape their youth empowerment conference. How community schools and parks and recreation have used the data to influence programming and where it's located in our community. Uh, PACs and DPACs working universally to, to look at issues such as sleep and nutrition broadly for all parents rather than a certain school. Uh, the Alberta Clyquit Health Network and the Clyquit Buzz Your Trust have also uh, received the reports and it was really great to see uh, the MDI data being reflected in the Clyquit Buzz Your Trust Vital Science Report. So it's, it's usable in so many areas by so many partners. And as these partnerships evolve and strengthen, the shared responsibility for human and social development will also grow stronger. So our hope in our district is that the MDI connects many of these groups and organizations to collaboratively improve outcomes for children and youth. And, and I think the school district can take a lead role in this. So in the end, um, one school's journey in this, our successes and our challenges, I think what's really important here, um, we started. We started to do something. Uh, we started to talk among each other. We, we learned from this and, and I can't underscore enough 
how much learning we have derived from using the MDI. Um, we've we've been acting. We've, we're doing something now about it, and we're being intentional. We want to fix things as a system, um, and sometimes we need to temper our expectations and to appreciate that it's a journey and that we truly need to work with others um, and that we need to be able to to accept that it can all be done at once and that, uh, you know, as a partner in the enterprise, um, school districts and communities can improve outcomes for, for children and youth, and, and the MDI has been an incredible part in that. So that's SD70 story. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, that was great and so well done, really. Um, just covered all the important content and really showed um, the journey that your district has been on and the idea that, you know, no one gets it right right from the beginning, but how uh, that, that was wonderful. So I think now is an opportunity for, um, I don't know if people have wrote, written in some questions so far or there's questions from previously. So I'll look to Maddie to see how we go and yes. <coughs> Great. So now, at this time, please pin any questions that came up throughout the presentation, or if you'd like to be unmuted, please raise your hand, and I will be happy to unmute you. I'm going to leave Greg unmuted as well. And in the meantime, I can pose a couple of questions that we received ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Great. So one um, good example, which we just heard from Greg, but uh, other examples of how the data has been used to plan programming in schools? Yeah, I think there's a number, I mean, we're gathering data and it's uh, it's interesting. There's been a number of districts that have really put a focus on, uh, particularly in the connectedness dimensions, at least in schools, the idea of the important adults and, and finding ways in which they can connect more to students and, and putting this effort on connecting with adults. But also, I think some schools, um, for example, the number, the increase in number of worries, there's been some schools that really have used it as a catalyst for having a focus on um, trying to reduce anxiety in students and maybe programs. I, I guess my, my sense is there's a host of approaches, but I, I really loved how Greg talks about the lottery approach versus the universal approach. That's how I would say it, that, you know, right now, uh, my experience, and Greg, you, you really uh, nailed it, is that uh, there's no um, one approach that's used in schools. And in fact, it's often hit and miss and like who a student has to, who comes into contact. And and so I haven't heard specifically, and I'd love any district student, that they have uh, used the MDI to do more of universal programming across an entire school or school district. Greg, do you know anything? Do you know? Well, I think that the nice thing is it helps us understand those various programs, the lottery balls, and, and where they're most appropriate. Um, you know, to our school plans and what schools are doing specifically, some are focusing on optimism. Some are looking at after-school activities, connectedness, self-regulation, and so on. And, and it helps us really understand, is this the most appropriate program for what we want to see? I mean, we, we look at MindUp and Friends and a, a bunch of other programs that people have been using in our schools. And, and it helps us make sure that what, is in, what we're trying to address or trying to do is matched by the program. And it, it's really giving us reason to reflect on, are there programs universally that we would like to adopt and use across our system to reach certain or develop certain competencies in, in, in students? Mm -hmm. No, it's a really good approach, and I think yeah. the idea of um, a program, I mean, it's interesting because I think there's some tension about programs versus practices. Some people don't like the idea of programs, but what we know, I mean, myself having also done research on a number of programs, what we know is these universal programs provide a way to scaffold these explicit teaching of skills um, and support for students. Great. One more question, I'm, and I'm combining a few questions that came in. We have. Um, a couple of questions around best practices in involving both community and specifically public health. And we have a number of health authority participants joining us. Yeah, I don't know, Greg, do you have some examples of the way you've, you've co collaborated with um, health, the health authority? Um, you know, we've done lots of work in our community with um, health, specifically in the area of community nutrition. Um, and some of those, um, the evidence is coming through the MDI and how important nutrition is, working with our public health uh, and, and to work with parents on the sleep piece. 
We have mm -hmm. had, you know, multiple grant writing opportunities through Dash BC and other organizations um, to get some funding to, to do some grant work, um, especially related to nutrition uh, in our schools. So the, the partnerships are there. Um, you know, public health is there. I think we also mentioned um, working with agencies like uh, Parks and Recreation and others to also be really intentional about how we engage with them. Um, I found the Child Youth Mental Health Substance Collaborative to be very interested in the information coming from the MDI as it connected with their work and how we can bring those resources into our school in a really purposeful way. Yeah, I think it, I think that it's the the potential is endless in terms of how you can use this as the catalyst for bridging the gap, you know, between health and education, you know, and so it brings people together because it's about all of the children in the community and and can then uh, be a way in which you can start conversations to think together. I loved your example of sleep. I know that there's been some where this really highlighted the importance of sleep uh, for children. And in fact, I didn't mention, again, I was going through the data, um, just very um, cherry picking some of it. But, you know, one of the things that we've really noticed in terms of a trend is there has been, um, in terms of the MDI over time, both for grade four and grade seven, a decrease in um, the amount of sleep they get per week. And so again, that was a really important public health concern. And of course, the other one would be, or many, uh, one of many would be the, um, the number of children who engage in sedentary activities after school with screen time, increasing screen time versus physical activities. And so that's another way to bring communities Mm -hmm. um, and help in communities together, schools. Great. Thank you. One more question from the audience. I wonder if any approach used to reduce anxiety in schools is informed by Dr. Stephen Poiget's polyvagal theory? I'm not familiar. Um, no, I, I'd say, I don't know. Greg, do you know of this? Uh, what was it? Maybe you could say it again so Greg can I think hear. it's the Stephen Poiget's polyvagal theory. Theory? Oh, Stephen Porges. I think, yeah, Porges, Stephen yeah. Porges. Yeah, I know Stephen Porges. Um, no, I don't think there's any, uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting. The question really brings up of how much we have the science gets translated to practice. Um, it's much more complex, you know, you take a program um, to implement it at a universal level. Again, the MDI isn't about targeting specific children with uh, clinical levels of anxiety um, because it's not, not a diagnostic tool. It's really a measure that looks at children at, at the level of the population and brings in programs or practices that are targeted toward that uh, that universal approach versus specific ones. However, um, you know, one thing, so I don't know of that program, but one thing just in, in especially thinking about the increasing anxiety is uh, I think of one district, for example, Revelstone when they heard, uh, they looked at the report and found so many high numbers of worries, they went at the time first asking kids what they worried about, um, what were their worries. And, and actually, I'll say in Coquitlam as well, I know I heard about a principal who, after they got their MDI results, went and had a conversation with the students asking, you know, what are the worries of grade sevens and let us learn more. So it really was a way to... Um, open, I think, for people to open their eyes and, and look at who the kids are before them. And whereas before they might uh, interpret uh, a child's behavior as um, in a more negative light, um, that after we're learning about the children's lives or students' lives, there's a, a increase in compassion and a change in mindset with how they understand um, why children would behave the way they do. Great. And Kim, if I can just build on, I think one of the yeah. things that we've learned too is to resist that temptation to move quickly from the MDI results to a program or a particular approach. And I, and I really reinforce the idea of going back and talking to students about what they, they reported in the MDI. And it's, it's a great piece to have focus groups um, with students to go back and to dig deeper into those results to really see what was going on, what gave them reason to answer that way before we quickly move to some sort of universal program or or practice. Yeah, I love that. And just so just to give a call out, shout out to the MDI field guide, there is a section on there of how to conduct focus groups with students with a step-by-step -step guideline. So people who are interested in saying, oh, those focus groups, they might be hard to do. I'm not sure where to start. There's some great uh, information on the uh, in the field guide. 
Great. So we have one final question for Greg before we'll sign off. Greg, was it easy to get administrators, teachers to buy in to setting a yearly well-being goal? And if so, how was it framed to get that buy-in from schools? Incredibly easy. I, I think deep down educators have, have always known that student well-being has a huge impact on their academic performance and how they, they thrive in schools. And, you know, our, our goal planning process is, yes, we still have goals related to intellectual development, literacy, numeracy, school completion, and so on. But any time our administrators talk about their school plans, they always start with their well-being goal. Uh, as I said earlier, this is not a top-down piece. This is as much bottom-up as it is anything. It's, it's really capitalized on, on the interest and the passion uh, of our schools to improve outcomes for, for children and youth. And our administrators have been um, incredibly supportive. Um, I'm incredibly proud of our system, uh, administrators, teachers, and others who have embraced it and, and are really carrying this. Um, it's been no challenge whatsoever uh, to get them to, to do that planning piece. There is a, a number of conversations that need to take place in getting there and um, you know, challenging some of those um, long-standing beliefs about what's the role of a teacher or not certainly are really important to move the system forward. Um, but generally, uh, I think that there was no, no resistance at all in generating a well-being goal. In fact, the biggest challenge was how to narrow it down to something that was specific and manageable rather than having people trying to do uh, six or seven things um, based on the MDI evidence. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I just want to, oh, wait, I, one last minute statement. It's going to be profound <laughs> by Michael. No, I just wanted to jump in here. Hi, my name is Michael Brigham, and I, uh, I work also at Help on uh, Digital Engagement and the Field Guide. And I just wanted to, while I still had you on the line, draw your attention to three things on the Connect page. So if you go to discovermdi.ca slash connect, um, there's three things that I'd like you to take a look at. The first, really quickly, Greg mentioned grants earlier in this call. We just put up a post about a Plan H grant for social connectedness and communities. The only eligible applicants are local governments, but it really stresses partnerships. And so if you are a school district or a health authority or uh, you know have a connection to local government, please put that under their nose. It would be a great way to get some money to help support uh, connectedness in your community, which we, we've just been talking about this whole call. Uh, the second piece is that if you have any remaining questions that we didn't get answered to, or if you have a shower thought tomorrow that you want us to, to address in a future webinar, please go to the uh, contact us section on that page, discoverymdi.ca slash connect. It's at the bottom. Um, anything, your thoughts on this webinar, your, your, your suggestions for future topics or questions that come up, please send them to us so that we can build our content and our future programming based around what you need. And the third request is somewhere in the middle of the page, we have uh, a video service to help record your own stories. And we'd really, really like communities to give that a try. Uh, we know that having firsthand accounts of how, the, how, how children in your community are living, what the MDI results mean to your organization or your school are, are probably the best way to get the message across. We've created some, some questions for you to use as a, as a starting point. We'd really love for you to try the service. It's free and it's really easy and um, we'd like to, to hear whether it works. So please go ahead and, and go to the middle of the page, tell your story there, and let us know how that goes. Thanks. Thank you Wonderful. so much. Oh, that was great, Michael. Thanks so much. And thank you to everyone. Uh, first to Greg, thanks so much for joining us and taking time from your busy day um, to help us. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to all of you um, for listening, for taking the time in the afternoon. And please contact us if you have any other questions um, or need clarification. And have a, a great afternoon.